what, what, if it is a, a, a U.S. election, what is the sort of the point in terms of people coming from other countries? I mean, what role do you think it can have or impact do you think it has? Uh, yeah, yeah. I'd like to address the question of uh, election formality. Uh, I've been with the United Nations stationed in Vienna 32 years, and I was one of the observers in the Bosnia election last year. Mm. This group was demanded by the United States of the UN and of the European Council, the European Union Council, to be sent to Bosnia to make sure that the elections are democratic. Mm. And long instructions were given not only to the observers, but even more so to the 15 parties or candidates in this election. And one point was that nobody should be excluded. Mm. Uh, even to the point that if he's a communist, he wants to run as a communist, he should be included. The, uh, the subject of today's press conference, as I think all of you know, uh, is to give the opportunity for a group of international observers to report on the events of this last weekend in the state of Michigan. Just to give people a bit of background, on February 22nd, the state of Michigan conducted both a Democratic and Republican primary. Uh, for reasons that I suppose only they are privy to, the Democratic Party in the state of Michigan behaved in an absolutely bizarre manner. First, uh, on instructions from the DNC, both Al Gore and Bill Bradley removed their names from the Michigan ballot, leaving Mr. LaRouche as the only Democrat on the ballot. The Michigan Democratic Party then proceeded to announce that there was no Democratic primary in the state of Michigan, something which was a complete lie. And they began to mobilize completely contrary to the rules of the Democratic Party as they were spelled out not only at the last convention, but in subsequent rules meetings that have taken place, they proceeded to urge Democrats that if they absolutely insisted on coming out to vote on February 22nd, which was the appointed day of the primary, that they should come out and they should vote for John McCain. Now, although John McCain is no longer a candidate, I think that most people here are aware of the fact that John McCain is a Republican and why the state Democratic Party would be advocating that Democrats come out and vote for a Republican is mysterious to many, but not to all of us. Because in fact, what we have seen since the beginning was the unfolding of a non-election in the United States. The intention last year, when we first embarked on the presidential season, was to run an election with two pre-anointed candidates, George W. Bush on the Republican side, mostly agreed by all to be a complete imbecile and totally unqualified for any public office, and on the Democratic side, Vice President Al Gore, who does indeed have unique qualifications to be the Democratic candidate, those qualifications being that he is probably the only potential Democratic candidate for president who George W. Bush, the imbecile, could beat. And that was the way things were supposed to be. Mr. LaRouche, in fact, vowed from the very beginning of his candidacy that that would simply not be permitted to happen. He cited the fact that in past presidential elections, at least in the recent past, the President of the United States was elected by less than 20 percent of the potential electorate. And LaRouche vowed that in this time of global crisis, in this time when the financial system is undergoing a systemic breaking apart, at this time when the strategic crises that we face are beyond any period in modern history, that at this time he would step forward and not only make himself available for the Democratic nomination, but that he would in fact run a campaign to win that nomination based on mobilizing that 80 percent of the U.S. population that has sat out previous elections, that has been largely disenfranchised and without voice. And that is the way Mr. LaRouche has run this campaign. Now, Joe Andrew, who is the current chairman of the Democratic National Committee, 
following in the footsteps of the previous chairman of the DNC, a well-known racist from South Carolina by the name of Don Fowler, declared that Lyndon LaRouche was not a bona fide Democrat and that any Democrat who cast his vote for Lyndon LaRouche should be informed in advance that his vote would be discarded. And it is with that that this campaign has proceeded. And so what we and Mr. LaRouche's principal campaign committee did was we turned to the LaRouche Ballot Defense Fund and we asked them to help us put a spotlight on what was going on in Michigan. From that, a group of international observers was put together and traveled to Michigan to observe the electoral process in the United States. I don't think the irony of that is lost on anyone, that in this country, which is so meticulous about giving instructions to countries around the world, to China, to Bosnia, to Sudan, to Nigeria, to make sure that they understand how democracy works, to make sure that these lesser nations understand how to conduct fair and honest elections. How ironic that this arbiter of fair and honest elections globally would itself be the subject of a group of international observers. But in fact, it's what was called for, it is what occurred, and I trust that you will find the results shocking. Uh, I find it particularly ironic, as Debbie indicated, that we in the United States, who the world looks to as the model for a democratic uh, 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 institutions and for free, free and fair elections, have had to call on international observers to help us reassert that right in the United States. Uh, and the only uh, uh, avenue available to us is to call on the judgment of the entire international community uh, to uh, uh, put some pressure on the United States to try and, and, and rectify this situation and guarantee that we have free and fair elections. Uh, I would um, like to ask the observers now to uh, give you their first-hand report to, to uh, give you a flavor of what actually happened. Uh, but first, let me just introduce the whole panel so that you know who's here. Uh, sitting to my left, or, or to the far left, I'll start there, is Orchard Cromer, who is representing the International Progress Organization. And uh, next to her is uh, Dr. Godfrey Benaisa, the former president of Uganda and the former attorney general of Uganda and the current chairman of the African Civil Rights Movement. Uh, next to him is Dr. Ernst uh, Winter, a professor at the Diplomatic Academy in uh, Vienna and a former official of the United Nations and somebody who has participated in, in uh, observing and supervising elections in uh, various countries. Uh, to my right is Amelia Boynton Robinson, uh, the leader of the fight for the voting rights uh, in the United States, the leader of the march uh, in Selma, Alabama uh, on Bloody Sunday, which was uh, commemorated last week, the 35th anniversary. Uh, sitting next to her is Dr. Hunter Huang, the chairman of the um, National Committee for the Reunification of China. And next to him is uh, Gabriela Liebisch, the editor of the German news weekly Neue Solidarität. Uh, these individuals, along with uh, the civil rights attorney J.L. Chestnut, also of Selma, Alabama, uh, came to Michigan. Uh, we uh, observed about 12 uh, caucuses and had uh, a number of uh, uh, I had discussions with both officials and voters and citizens and observed the proceedings in which uh, the, the exactly the things that were threatened were carried out. Uh, that is, voters who wished to vote for LaRouche were prevented from doing so. Um, campaign workers for LaRouche were prevented from distributing uh, literature and campaigning for LaRouche, and including uh, some of the observers themselves were denied access to the proceedings. Uh, uh, Mr. Chestnut was actually barred from observing the proceedings at, at one caucus. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, I was for 32 years an international civil servant. I'm now retired. My post was a D2 in UNESCO, UNEP, and uh, UNIDO. And now as a hobby, being a trained political scientist, as a hobby, I help some of the new nations to set up their constitutional 
uh, formalities, particularly as concerns elections. Uh, when I was asked uh, to uh, come to the States as an observer for the LaRouche uh, campaign, and I heard these particular rumors, I was skeptical. I couldn't believe that this was possible. The countries that I've been assigned to, like Ukraine and Bosnia uh, and Slovakia, Slovenia, they look up to the United States, uh, and they think the American Constitution is the ideal constitution for a democratic republic. Uh, they copy many of the clauses and, uh, and customs, including elections. And so I was really in doubt that uh, uh, procedures that are reminding myself of a different day and age would be taking place here. I should mention that today, 62 years ago today, Austria was occupied by the Germans, and the very first thing they did is they organized a plebiscite. Intimidated the people, locked us, others up. In the first three days, they imprisoned 70,000 people, mainly the leading elite, and had a plebiscite. And I must now say that my major impression, I was only at one congressional district caucus, but my major impression was that I was witnessing a plebiscite. And this uh, shook me a, a great deal, really, I must say that. Emotionally, I was uh, numb for a while because the intimidation, the physical intimidation, the verbal intimidation was enormous. Uh, they were practically trying to grab me and throw me out uh, physically, but we stood our ground. And I tried to argue with uh, Congressman Dingle and Christopher Smith and some of the top people in the Democratic Party that this is counterproductive. They're not going to uh, achieve anything thereby because uh, the, the more negative the actions are, the more publicity they will be getting. And I, I have to report back that there, there is an agency in the UN that is interested, that of course is the OECE interested. Uh, and so uh, they were saying, and this is very interesting, that the Democratic Party was and is a private organization. They can set their own rules and they can do what they please. Uh, and they set a rule that uh, nobody, even as an observer to the LaRouche uh, uh, participation in this caucus, are allowed to come. In fact, they printed a sheet and says, only observers that are for Al Gore can come. And it seems incredible that you know these things are done black and white. I mean, one could imagine that there's some backdoor arrangements, but to print all this up in black and white and uh, take the risk of... Uh, uh, having it spread all over the world is very, very counterproductive. I took a picture of all this because it, I think it is, uh, for modern people, very important to see this rather than to hear about it. Uh, then, as we left, after the uh, vote was taken, incidentally taken, also, uh, and please do excuse me, I'm discomforted by seeing things that happened 62 years ago in my own country, uh, it was taken uh, being the, the, the delegates being asked to stand up. And after they stood up, then they were asked to raise their right hand. Hi. And it was like this. It was like a whole crowd of Hitler people standing there, raising their hand. I said, it must have been incredible. Because a thing like this ought to be on a sheet of paper, be put in a box, be counted, be recounted, be checked that there's no stuffing of ballot boxes, but not a movement attitude, a, a, an emotional political movement attitude. But as we left the building, uh, uh, some of these local people came up and said, oh, we're really sorry this happened, you know, we're surprised that this happened. And looking at the faces of these people, I saw them as being maybe uh, car workers and engineers of Polish descent and Italian descent, people who served well, worked hard all their life long, and are now uh, proud to be able to help in a caucus and we're actually quite shocked what their own people were doing. So thank you very much. I was very surprised when I found out that the United States of America has taken the tactics that were used back there in the 1900s to control the parties. I'm surprised because I have seen this thing happen in the 30s, in the 20s and 30s in the South. And they're doing the same thing 
that they did back there in those days. I have been involved in seeing that people got the opportunity to register and to vote. I fought to see that the right to vote became a reality for everybody. And I see now that it's being destroyed. I have witnessed in Michigan that they are destroying it and it's becoming a part of the whole nation. When I was asked to go to Michigan to observe, I didn't expect to find what I found. We went to this union building where they were holding uh, the caucus. And going into the building, they looked at us and they found, they felt that we weren't uh, there to cast a vote. They asked, what are you here for? We told them that we were observers. They said, well, you can't go into the room now where they were registering. And that was about 9.30, between 9.30 and 10 o'clock. And they said it opens at 11 and closes at 1. For people to go down and register from 11 until 1. Well, can you imagine people who are working, people who get off at 4.30, all of those folk could not come down and register because they would close. It seems as though we are reverting to the 1900s and 1910 when I was told by a statistician that uh, they had a slot and the votes were cast in the slot. This is when African Americans had positions. And when uh, they got, when the poll closed, they moved that box and put the stuffed box right under. And when that's the way African Americans lost the, posi the political positions they had. And we are reverting to the same thing to say that we are not going to count the votes of Lyndon LaRouche. We are going to throw them out. Aren't we going backward instead of forward? I'm sorry, I have a cold, an African cold. <laughs> which increased in intensity because of what I saw in Michigan. <laughs> it was a very bad experience. I expected something more than what I saw, and I got nothing out of it. And you are the, the only country in the modern world who won your independence after eight years of bitter fighting against the British to establish the first democratic republic in the whole world. And yet you've done, you are doing so badly that you are no longer a model. You can't be a model to us when you continue like this. So when I went to Michigan, I later on, after being rejected, they rejected us, they told us to sit outside in another room until Congressman John Conyers came in, who I think that was his constituency, and he talked to us, and he talked to the lady who had rejected us, who was a retired superintendent of schools in that area. We were, I, I was escorted into the room by the Honorable John Conyers, congressman. I was very intimidated. I fear that perhaps I may meet the same fate as my fellow African, Amadou Diallo. I may be shot. It was so intimidating. We had gone there only to observe, to act as observers. We had no business to, to, to vote or do anything of the kind. But I was really completely what happened sent, uh, sent shock waves down my spine. And it would have sent the same shock waves down the spines of all Africans if they had to be there. Very recently, Vice President Gore went to Kuala Lumpur, the capital city of Malaysia, and gave a dressing down 
to the Malaysia leadership. He said, among other things, that they are undemocratic, that they don't observe, they ob they comp they don't observe human rights, and so on and so forth. The Malaysians were very angry, and rightly so. And here is the same man who is now standing as a candidate to govern this country as president, doing exactly, doing even worse than uh, Mahathir Mohamed, the Prime Minister of Kuala Lumpur. I mean, Prime Minister of Malaysia. It's really a shocking experience. I, I was horrified myself, and that's the kind of message I'm going to pass on to my fellow Africans who would like to know what's going on in the United States. Are they democratic as they pretend to be? Or is it a mere window dressing to say that they are democratic when they don't follow the first principles of democracy, of having a fair and free election? First, I want to say the result of the vote will keep secret. I believe that's wrong. Second, Mr. Norwich was is treated unfairly by DNC. Democratic Party is not a problem party. Mr. Norwich's name was not on the ballot. That's wrong. Third, less than one percent of registered voters decide the candidate for ninety-nine percent of people. That's wrong. I was told the population of nine di district is about six hundred thousand, but in Lake Area percent there were only about 40 people come to vote. Why? Fifth, I want to say, I was personally treated polite by the one who charged of the Cox, not like Mr. White, Dr. White, other people be treated, refuse them to come in, but I was treated polite. But with what I observed, I believe, I feel deeply sad. Thank you. So let me first state um, that this is not the first time that I uh, speak in a LaRouche-related uh, matter on behalf of the International Progress Organization, a non-governmental organization in consultative status with the United Nations. But I personally addressed several consecutive sessions of both the Human Rights Commission and the Subcommission for the Protection of Minorities of the United Nations in Geneva at the time when uh, LaRouche was in prison. And uh, thus, the IPO's interventions put this case, the case of Lyndon LaRouche, uh, officially on the record of the United Nations as a case of blatant violation of human rights in the United States. Uh, the, um, uh, the one um, th on the background that officials of the uh, uh, Democratic Party had publicly stated that you know LaRouche uh, votes should not be counted, I found myself in a curious situation when it was announced at this caucus meeting that one of the two other caucuses in the uh, Genesee uh, um, County had voted 48 for Gore, two for Bradley, zero for others or uncommitted. There's no way I could tell whether this, this zero actually meant zero. It could have well meant eight votes for the Rouge, six votes for the Rouge. You simply cannot tell. Uh, actually, the one thing we could tell was reported yesterday by the press that there were no more than 3,600 voters who came out in the entire state of Michigan. Um, the, um, I would share the view that was already expressed by Amelia Boynton Robinson, which was shared also with people I spoke to on the site, that the uh, disadvantage of having a caucus uh, lies is certainly giving, uh, I mean, or is certainly giving disadvantage to working people who 
cannot, like in primary elections, choose the time when they go to vote, cast their vote in a period of over 30, or 12 or 13 hours during the daytime, but rather are forced to be there for as long as two hours uh, during, I mean, in the middle of the day, uh, which is, of course, you know, dis uh, especially disenfranchising many of those people who certainly do not work for fun on a Saturday. Uh, the, other, uh, quest, uh, the other thing that I found very worrisome was the form of the ballots. Uh, it may not, it, uh, people here may think it happened before, but still, when I see a ballot where you have to fill in your name, address, date of birth, telephone number, and e email address, if you so have, uh, and cast your vote on that same piece of paper and put it all into the box of the voting, that to me is not... I mean, an election uh, that's rather, you know, some form of interrogation or what do we want. On the way to Flint, Michigan, I happened to hear in the car, in the radio, I cannot tell in which, pro which program, an interview with uh, DNC chairman, Michigan chairman uh, Mark Brewer, who was speaking on the Caucasus. He wouldn't even mention, uh, he, uh, of course, he did not mention LaRouche's name, but he also wouldn't even mention that there was the possibility to, to, to uh, write in a vote or vote uncommitted or whatever, even though the ballot very clearly indicated that. This is, of course, you know, also, again, a uh, very I mean, big sign of, of undemocratic uh, behavior, besides the fact that you know, uh, the uh, OSC, OSCE guidelines for fair elections that are being, I mean, presented uh, to other countries uh, clearly have, an, have, an, uh, have an, a paragraph that equal representation in the media of all candidates running uh, should, is, a, I mean, is mandatory for democratic elections. Well, my experience was quite shocking. I was at this caucus in the United, uh, the, uh, UAW building in uh, East Jefferson 8031 in Detroit, where Martin Luther King's attorney, J.L. Chestnut, was gooned away. He couldn't go in. They wouldn't let him in, even though, according to the law, I understand, every presidential candidate has the right to have his observers in such caucus meetings. I was let in. Why was I let in? Because I told them, <laughs> that I represent a German weekly, and I had my press card, and they let me in. I have to tell you that, I mean, of course, it was clear to me that caucuses are not secret elections. But I imagined them to be a kind of discussion where people would come, uh, registered democratic voters who live in the area, and they would bring up, up issues what, uh, what uh, is a concern for them, uh, education or drugs or housing, or they would discuss these things, and then representatives of the various uh, presidential candidates would get up and would make a speech in favor of uh, the candidate they are favoring, and then in this context uh, we would uh, uh, see LaRouche supporters come up with uh, with a speech in favor of LaRouche and, and explaining to people that they were able to uh, write in LaRouche's name on this ballot. And what it was, I really have to say this, it is nothing, there was no discussion whatsoever. And also no speech in, in favor of any presidential candidate. It was it's just a method to, to avoid secret free elections in the form of a primary. And that is what I have to report uh, in my newspaper uh, back in Germany. Um, it is the caucus process as such as it has degenerated apparently, uh, has turned into a mockery and a travesty uh, of free elections. Um, first of all, Mrs. Kramer said, you have to fill in name and address and everything uh, and in front of uh, in, the, in the entrance hall where the registration takes place, uh, uh, accumulation of goons, really big people uh, with arms and with yellow uh, arm ribbons, sergeant in arms is uh, written on it. So, and the people would be told, you have to not only write in your name, you have to vote right there. You have to cross the candidate, which is on the ballot, or to write in what you want. Uh, Right there, if people didn't, if they had not uh, themselves been intimidated in this way, 
uh, they, they actually didn't have to. Huh? They said, I have to think about it and you cannot force me. So, but most people are intimidated and do it. I was not allowed to inspect the ballot boxes. In fact, when I tried to take just a picture of the three ballot boxes, Gore, Bradley, uh, other, uh, they didn't let me do it. Uh, and in fact, uh, my tape recorder was thrown to the ground and it was a big brawl and I thought uh, that was the end of it. Uh, then it somehow calmed down because uh, one of the La Rouge supporters present, uh, Bill Lewis, is a lawyer and he very calmly uh, cleared up uh, the situation. So, uh, second thing, uh, what Mr. Huang reported, uh, I think is very important. He was at a caucus uh, where the vote, votes were not counted at all. People would uh, put their ballots in the boxes, having to stand in line, sh 11 o'clock sharp, in a long line, go up in front of the Gore box, very small line in front of the Bradley box, eh? uh, and also a small line in front of the La Rouge box. Eh? So, but after this happened, they would take the boxes and go away without even counting them. I think this is a major uh, irregularity. Okay, it turns out that in uh, <clears throat> what I, what in the debriefing process of, of the various caucuses we could uh, go to, um, uh, the La Rouge vote uh, was counted uh, formally in a couple of caucuses and in the major caucuses the Goa people would focus on, including uh, the one where I was, the La Rouge vote was not counted, but it was just in the category of other. And as it stands, uh, the La Rouge votes, which were formally counted uh, by the caucus managers in various smaller uh, caucuses uh, around uh, Detroit, where I met people who told me this, uh, they will go to the party headquarters and there they will not be counted. So, and I, we, we were sitting around a table and we were asking the we observers, that is, we were asking ourselves, is this the standard of free and democratic elections, the United States government, Madeleine Albright, and the uh, endowment for democracy is demanding from other nations around the world to observe. Thank you. Um, let me also mention that uh, there was another uh, international observer on the, uh, who, who observed the caucuses from Poland, Mrs. Hanya Warnke, who was unable to be with us today, but she also will be filing, filed a report with us after the caucuses, uh, and, and her findings will be incorporated in our final report. Uh, I would just like to say how grateful I am as an American and on behalf of all the American people that we have such distinguished international observers to come and help us. Um, we, we need this international help at this time. And as Dr. Benice has said, uh, this is th that we need this help so that we can help the rest of the world uh, because it's, uh, it's the United States leadership is, is needed right now. And unless we can uh, open up this fair election, open up this election process, to Mr. LaRouche's uh, campaign and to stop this kind of intimidation, then uh, the world will be in a very sad shape. 